Now, today's webinar is the Early Retiree Divestor Workforce, a quantitative analysis of early retirement among health professionals using CLSA data. So let me introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sarah Yuko. Dr. Sarah Yuko is, a, is an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Health Sciences at the University of Prince Edward Island. She's a registered dietitian with more than 10 years of clinical experience. Her primary interest is in human resources and in her program of research, she, she seeks to better understand what keeps Canadian allied health professionals in their jobs and the impact of allied health professionals' continuity on patient outcomes. So over to you, Dr. Yuko. Thank you very much. All right. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to listen to my webinar talking about my thesis research, which I used um, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging data for. Um, and as already mentioned, I was looking at how the early ret retiree can divest the workforce and uh, quantitatively exploring early retirement and involuntary retirement a bit among health professionals. So uh, the members of my committee for my thesis were uh, Dr. Trish Ray at uh, the Alberta School of Business at the University of Alberta, and Dr. Carol Estabrooks and Dr. Greta Cummings, both um, at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Nursing. Uh, I did complete my PhD there in the Faculty of Nursing despite being a registered dietitian. I do have no disclosures for um, non-financial or financial interests in the subject matter of this research, and neither do any of my committee members. So just to give you an idea of the structure for this presentation, um, I'm going to be first talking a bit about the study objectives, the methods, and then the results, the so what, um, the, and the next steps, and then any questions you may have, you can ask at the end. Uh, I did have four manuscripts that were incorporated into my paper-based thesis, um, and I have cited them throughout, so, so several of them have already been published. Um, the first has been published in the Canadian Journal on Aging, and that's um, the development of the conceptual models that I used and tested. The second paper is a descriptive paper, and it's in press with healthcare policy. And uh, the third is an early retirement paper that was published in Human Resources for Health. And the fourth on involuntary retirement has yet to be submitted. But basically, what the way I'm going to do the presentation is I'm going to sort of talk about all of the objectives for um, the entire study and then the methods for the entire, uh, including all four papers and ongoing like that, just to make it a little less disjointed. So my question when I started my study was sort of why do health professionals, specifically registered nurses and allied health professionals, retire early? A uh, report from the Global World Health Workforce Alliance and World Health Organization had estimated a deficit of 12.9 million skilled health professionals by 2035, which would be a 79% increase to the current deficit at the time the report was written. So it seemed as though prolonged labor force participation among health professionals was becoming increasingly necessary. And nurses specifically are known as really a staple of the healthcare system and without them, other healthcare professionals really struggle to deliver any health services. And for the first time in 20 years, uh, in 2014, the supply of registered nurses in Canada had declined. Allied health professionals, which I defined in my study as baccalaureate degree prepared, as a minimum health professionals, including speech language pathologists, pharmacists, dietitians, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and clinical social workers. They all provide really key services across the healthcare continuum, and they're of particular value in the prevention, treatment, and management of chronic diseases. Comparatively, both RNs and health professional, allied health professionals require a baccalaureate level of education at a minimum, and both groups are female dominated and can be found in diverse healthcare settings. Their professional services are often provided in shared workspaces, and neither are likely to be the most responsible practitioner, as this is the typical purview of the physician. The differences between the two groups are most apparent when we consider the content and scheduling of their work, with nursing tasks frequently being more physical uh, and more demanding on the body than those of allied health professionals. 
and nurses being more likely to work rotating elongated shifts on evening nights and weekends. So to, for definitions for this, all of my study, um, early retirement was defined as retirement before the age of 65, and retirement was considered involuntarily if the individual who had retired considered their retirement to have been involuntary, um, as this was how it was measured in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And there was real no, no real literature indication of how frequently um, involuntary retirement occurred among uh, registered nurses and allied health professionals. So going to the objectives, I started by uh, developing and validating conceptual models of early and involuntary retirement among registered nurses and allied health professionals. And then um, using the CLSA data after that, I was able to identify and compare factors that were reported to influence retirement decisions among registered nurses and allied health professionals. Following that, I looked to explore the relative importance of factors that influence early retirement and on time or late retirement, so that being 65, later than 65 years, among publicly employed nurses and allied health professionals. And then I quantitatively, sorry, <laughs> quantitatively tested conceptual models of early and involuntary retirement um, in that same population. Last, um, Two objectives, I obsessed or obsessed the model fit and the association of identified variables with either early or involuntary retirement across occupational groups. Um, so trying to look at differences um, in the testing between the RNs and the AHPs. And last, tried to identify and discuss some implications for RN and AHP workforce policy. So I started off with a theory to guide my methods. Uh, many theories and conceptual frameworks have been developed and applied to enhance understanding of retirement and retirement decisions. The life course as a key concept in the life course perspective is defined as the coalescing of age-graded trajectories, which includes family pathways and career paths, which are contingent on changes in conditions and the availability of future options and short-term transitions, such as exits from education and retirement. And I selected and uh, the life course perspective because, firstly, uh, employment-related decisions intertwine significantly with many other decisions uh, during the life course. Second, because the perspective is inherently interdisciplinary, um, so it incorporates concepts and learnings from economics, anthropology, developmental psychology, demography, and sociology. And this was important to me both being sort of an interdisciplinary scholar, so being a registered dietitian who did a Master's of Health Administration and then ended up having a PhD in nursing, uh, but also because I was looking at multiple different professions who would come from, um, you know, very different theoretical and uh, didactic forms of education. Um, and last, the life course perspective encouraged looking at micro, meso, and macro level factors, which was important to me, so even though um, I may not have been able to look at all those factors with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging data. It did help me to develop what I hope are comprehensive conceptual models that can be tested later potentially um, and have more accommodation for some of the, particularly the meso-level factors. And that's what this graph, which I developed for my uh, study, is supposed to just demonstrate that over time, an individual has their own career trajectory towards retirement and they may retire on time, as we call it, or uh, late, early or late. It may be voluntary or involuntary, and it may be a partial or a full retirement. And factors at the macro level and the micro level and the meso level, which is right in the middle where that trajectory is, will all have an impact on what types of decisions they make about their retirement. So I won't talk too much about the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, as it, many of you are probably very familiar with it, um, but it was uh, developed to provide an infrastructure for state-of-the-art interdisciplinary population-based research. And for this study, I accessed baseline data for all resp respondents in both cohorts, which um, the comprehensive cohort, which included 30,000 people who had complete face-to-face -face interviews and site visits, and 20,000 in the tracking cohort who completed telephone interviews. Um, 
and the questions, as you probably know, there was many questions on the survey related to demographics, health status, health behaviors, physical ability, psychological mental health, uh, socioeconomic status, and participation in the workforce. And specifically for my purposes, they, they did ask about occupation and settings of employment. So as far as my steps go, I began with a literature review uh, and I conducted this search in multiple electronic databases. I ended up including 23 studies sort of in developing the conceptual model. There was a real absence of relevant studies related to retirement among allied health professionals in particular. And there was a limited scope and fairly low quality of existing reviews on registered nurse retirement. And then there was multiple meta-analyses and reviews related to sort of retirement in the broader population, which obviously would include health professionals. So I elected to sort of include results from high quality reviews that from the broader population, um, individual studies and reviews on registered nurse retirement, and then any individual studies that existed on allied health professional retirement. So after developing the models, where all the factors identified as contributing to retirement were sort of added into the models, in, into the appropriate model, whether early or involuntary retirement. And last, I conducted interviews with 14 current and former health professionals between 45 and 85 years old um, to sort of validate the models to find out if they appeared to be um, you know, valid in line with their experience. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that on the next slide. So the goal, um, these were the demographics of people who participated in my qualitative interviews. So as you can see, I tried to get a range from across the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging age range from 45 to 85. Um, and I tried to have one re re registered nurse represented, or sorry, represented in each category, and then the allied health professionals divided across the categories fairly equally. Um, and 50% of them were already retired and the other were not, which means that they were able to give me um, sort of their, they were in that age range, but still able to give me their per perceptions of what would impact on their decision making. Uh, I was able to get um, different provinces or representation from different provinces and from many of the allied health professionals, which actually made me quite satisfied to, especially some thing, uh, people like radiation therapists where there aren't as many of them. It was nice and speech language pathologists to get um, representation in my interviews. So ideally, I was trying to achieve sort of a face validity of my conceptual models, and I tried to recruit them based on the principles of maximum variation sampling. So prior to the interview, I sent them the conceptual models, so both the early and involuntary retirement conceptual models, which we'll see later. And I conducted the interviews either over the telephone or Skype, and one took place in person. And they were asked explicitly if the model appeared clear, logical and relevant to the retirement of registered nurses and allied health professionals. Additionally, I asked them if they had any changes they would suggest to improve the model. I analyzed the registered nurse and allied health professional responses separately to sort of see if there was any comparison across the professional groups in terms of differences. Um, and then I applied those results to refine the models. And if I thought that factors uh, factors were added or adjusted in the model if more than two people who had participated in the qualitative interviews identified it as an issue. So this was a big step for me, the data cleaning. Um, as you might have guessed from the way I've described who I included, I didn't use all of the participants in the CLSA. I used only those in the occupations of interest. Um, so originally, my understanding had been that the CLSA was going to code occupation and setting of employment. Uh, so I was kind of informed that that was decided, they decided not to do that. So I ended up reviewing free text entries for both occupation and setting of employment for all 50,000 respondents and pulling out only those who are publicly employed, registered nurses and allied health professionals. So this was complicated by the fact that a lot of nurses reported themselves as simply a nurse. And this could have meant registered nurse, licensed practical nurse, or healthcare aide. So for those who didn't specifically identify themselves as registered nurses, I filtered out those who had less than a baccalaureate level degree. 
Um, so as a result, I'm sure that there may have been some diploma prepared registered nurses who had identified themselves only as a nurse and I might have missed them even though they were registered. It's also possible that some licensed practical nurses or healthcare aides had undergraduate degrees in other fields um, and weren't actually registered nurses. As far as setting goes, this was also free text. And so I was looking mainly at publicly employed, or that was my intention. So I removed participants who reported self-employment, retail employment, or government employment um, from the sample as my objective was to sort of look at people to try to give information of relevance for health policymakers and administrators in the public health care system, inclusive of hospitals, regional public health centers, primary care centers, and provincially run long-term care facilities. So in some cases, that setting was really unclear. So if it was simply healthcare, I included them in the sample. So it is definitely possible that some respondents were self-employed or employed outside the public health care system. So the type of model testing uh, I used was logistic regression. Um, what this did mean is that everyone who was included in my model testing had to be retired already. So because the binary was for the logistic regression, the outcome was either um, early retirement or not early retirement or um, involuntary or non-voluntary, but the premise is that you've retired already. So this meant that anyone who wasn't already retired but who met my criteria for profession couldn't be included in my um, regression models. So I did do some exploratory data analysis, looking for outliers, distribution, and variance. And this was definitely an appeal of the CLSA data is that there was very minimal missing data, um, especially the, probably the one with the most was income, but even then it was very low. Uh, one issue was just that the voluntariness of retirement, so whether or not retirement was voluntary, was only asked of one of the cohorts. And this significantly limited my sample size for testing the model of involuntary retirement. So I did conduct correlations, um, collinearity, and I looked at variance inflation factor before conducting non-stepwise unconditional multivariate logistic regression. For the early retirement model, I had enough, um, enough people to run a separate model for the registered nurses and allied health professionals, and that allowed me to compare them. Uh, but for involuntary retirement, I wasn't able, so I had to do a blended sample and use occupation as a variable instead of um, separating by profession, which again was because only one cohort answered the question about the voluntariness of their retirement. So uh, this descriptive, in my descriptive paper, um, I basically showed because I was able to use the full sample for this paper of people who hadn't yet retired and people who had retired in each of the professions. I was able to um, look at age of retirement, uh, the mean and the standard deviation for, and then the planned retirement age uh, and the mean and standard deviation for that for registered nurses, pharmacists, social workers, dietitians, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, SLPs, and other allied health professionals, which included audiologists, radiation therapists, and child life specialists. Um, so the age of retirement did range from about 55.8 among SLPs to 60.5 among other allied health professionals with a close um, sort of second oldest being pharmacists. And the planned retirement age for those um, people who hadn't yet retired ranged from 61.6 among nurses to 62.8 among pharmacists. And what I think is most important to me to take away from this is that all of these are pretty well below the age of 65. Um, so even the planned retirement ages were all below the age of 65. And the average age of retirement um, for nurses in particular is 58.1 and was statistically significantly different than allied health professionals average age of retirement as a group. Okay, so in this table, which is also in the descriptive paper, which is uh, in press, I was able to compare factors contributing to retirement. So uh, not all people, so basically people who hadn't yet retired weren't necessarily asked which factors they thought might contribute to their retirement in all the, all the cohorts, but I was able to see um, sort of which factors of the 
factors contributing to retirement um, were more significant for early retirees versus on time or late, and which were more significant for RNs versus AHPs. So just as a, uh, I don't know if it's a reminder, but the question people were asked were just sort of like, did financial possibility, was this a contributor to your decision to retire, yes or no? So it was sort of a binary, and people could choose more than one of these as factors contributing to their retirement. So the only significant difference there was between early retiring RNs and allied health professionals was that RNs were less likely to report a desire to pursue hobbies as contributing to their retirement decision, um, whether it was early or on time or late, which I found really interesting and I ha still haven't really found a reason to say why that may be. And then as far as differences between early and on time or late retirees, regardless of profession, early retirees were more likely to indicate that financial possibility, requirement for caregiving, and organizational restructuring had contributed to their retirement decision, whereas on time or late retirees were more likely to indicate that a desire to stop working contributed to their decision to retire. So I know this is a really busy slide, but this is basically the conceptual model for early retirement that I came up with um, after you know the literature review and, and had validated or did face validity with participants. So none of the uh, people interviewed, um, I didn't end up having or two, two or more people recommend a change to this uh, particular model in terms of what impacts on early retirement both registered nurses and allied health professionals felt that the model was clear, logical, and relevant. So obviously, I mean, it may not be obvious, but I wasn't able to test all of these variables. Not all of them were in the CLSA, and some of them were in the CLSA, but were not included for both cohorts. So there's different reasons why I might not be able to include them in my testable model. Um, so, and the another reason was limited sample size. So I ended up selecting variables for inclusion in my tested model based on the highest correlations with early retirement and those that were factors speaking specifically to retirement decision making. So like those questions of was, you know, financial possibility a factor in your decision to retire just because those were most uh, most related to my question and also most temporally focused because um, a lot of the questions asked are true to the current time, so the time when they were originally asked by the CLSA, sort of like, what is your income, or those types of questions, whereas, was this a factor in your decision to retire, puts it at the time and place of um, their retirement decision. Okay, so what you see here is my re the results of my logistic regression. So you can see the RN model and the allied health professional model on the right side, and the RN model on the left. and um, Basically, for RNs, there was uh, several significant odds ratios um, with financial possibility as a factor contributing to retirement. Basically, there was a 2.49 greater odds of having retired early if somebody indicated that was a pos uh, one of the factors. Um, organizational restructuring was associated with a 3.94 greater odds of having retired early. and um, 7.60 greater odds of having retired early was uh, related to caregiving responsibilities. Uh, and then uh, on the other side, for um, you know a decreased odds of retiring early, being tired of work was associated with an odds ratio of 0.49. So basically, people who identified as being tired of work were half as likely to have retired before the age of 65. Uh, organizational restructuring was also predictive of early retirement among allied health professionals, and they had a slightly higher odds ratio um, than nurses with 5.59, and that was basically the only factor that was significantly predictive of early retirement in both groups. So this is the model of involuntary retirement. Involuntary retirement is much less studied, and so it's not surprising, it wasn't surprising that there was far fewer uh, articles that specifically explored this. Um, and the candidates of people who reviewed it for me uh, thought that it was a clear, logical, and relevant model. We did end up modifying it, or I did end up modi modifying it, because more than one person indicated that they thought caregiving responsibilities may be necessary or should be included in the model as contributing to involuntary retirement in this group. 
Um, so as I said, the sample size was a great issue here. And if you're familiar with logistic regression, you'll know that cases are, is how you determine the number of, um, you know, the power of your model or how much power you need. So because in uh, involuntary retirement, so the issue being not only that one cohort didn't answer this question, but also that involuntary retirement is actually fairly rare in this population. It meant I had very few cases. Um, so I was only able to test a very limited number of variables in my model. Um, so I tested only self-rated general health, chronic diseases, which is basically a continuous number of chronic diseases, caregiving as a factor for retirement and occupation um, were included in the model. So here's the model results. Uh, this is the paper. The manuscript is still in preparation. Uh, if anyone has any tips of where a journal that might be interested in this type of study, I'd be very interested in hearing. Uh, so as you can see, only 8% of variance in involuntary retirement was explained by the model. So this may be partially, obviously, that I didn't get to test all the, the different um, variables that I had indicated, but it may also be that a lot is not understood about involuntary retirement as of yet. Um, the only thing that was significantly predictive in this population of involuntary retirement was self-reported health. So in this case, it's sort of um, counterintuitive, but a one-digit increase in self-reported health is actually associated with a poorer sense of health. Um, so basically, someone with a very poor health rating which was self-reported would have had or did have 6.3 greater odds of involuntary retirement than someone with a very good health rating. Um, allied health professionals as compared to registered nurses had a far lower odds of involuntary retirement with an odds ratio of 0.24. But this should be interpreted with caution just because there was such a small number of allied health professional respondents that reported involuntary retirement. Um, the majority of the people in this sample were registered nurses. So as far as the results go, um, in word form, I guess, essentially registered nurses and allied health professionals were largely in agreement regarding the clarity, logic, and relevance of the conceptual models that I had developed. The average age of RN retirement of 58.1 years is significantly lower than that of allied health professionals from a, like a statistical perspective. Uh, financial possibility and desire to stop working are among the most frequently reported factors contributing to early and on time or late retirement among registered nurses and allied health professionals. Eighty five percent and seventy seven percent of allied health professionals do retire early. Uh, the model of early retirement as tested explained a variance of twenty five percent or a maximum of twenty five percent of variance. Um, and I believe this is largely because a lot of the meso-level variables were not included and, and many of the macro as well. The only real sort of macro one was looking at province of residence, which could give an indication of how provincial policies affect retirement decision making. making. Um, RNs and HPs whose retirement decision had been influenced by organizational restructuring were more likely to have retired early. Registered nurses with caregiving responsibilities were more likely to retire early, and only 8% of variation in involuntary retirement was explained by the tested model. And you know, it's somewhat surprising even that things like chronic disease were not predictive of involuntary retirement. Uh, some of the key limitations to the study are related to this, um, my study, are related to the timing of the CLSA survey in terms of, so some questions that were asked that I would have included in my early retirement model, like things related to marital status, household income, and dependent kids living at home uh, are reflective of the individual's current status, and they may not reflect the status uh, that they had at the time of the retirement. So they may have been married at retirement and not married now, or vice versa. Um, so that was one factor. Um, and then even questions about, you know, did this contribute to your decision to retire may be subject to recall bias because there are some people who may have retired in the sample as many as 20 years before um, that, that question was being asked to them. So their memory um, may not be completely accurate. So in conclusion, uh, registered nurses and allied health professionals do consider many factors when they're contemplating early retirement. There's much that remains to be known about publicly employed RN and allied health professional pathways to retirement, particularly involuntary. 
and um, the conceptual models have only been partially tested, so further quantitative testing is definitely needed. Um, some of the administrative and policy implications, strategies to reduce rates of early retirement among registered nurses and allied health professionals might include reducing the frequency of restructuring in healthcare, or at a minimum, sort of improving the implementation and the management of these restructuring efforts. A potentially legislated expansion of paid leave policies to people providing informal care. And a subsidization of caregiving support for would-be caregivers who wish to remain in the workforce. As far as involuntary retirement goes, uh, work-based interventions, there are some that have been proven to improve self-rated health. And self-rated health was the only factor predictive of involuntary retirement. So, um, you know, maybe some of these interventions could improve self-rated health, which reduces the risk of involuntary retirement in this population. And I do want to add, just to make it, because um, I haven't explicitly stated this, uh, to make it clear is that I don't think necessarily that the goal would be to even have everybody work till 65 or to increase the average to 65, but just based on the volume of professionals, particularly registered nurses, if we were able to even to increase the uh, retirement age by six months on average, the mean retirement age, this could have a significant impact on uh, work you know, supply and demand in the country of Canada and help us to maybe uh, stave off some shortages or predicted shortages in these populations in this, um, or these professional populations. So as far as next steps go, uh, I am hoping to deepen my understanding of publicly employed uh, pathways to early and involuntary retirement. I am hoping to get some funding to get a larger sample of allied health professionals because I would like to make comparisons across um, allied health professions. I believe that there could be very significant differences in the way, for instance, that a pharmacist approaches retirement than an uh, occupational therapist. And this is um, knowing that it's one reason why I think there may not have been as many significant results in relation to allied health professionals in that model where RNs had a few, and that might be just because there's some of that difference within the group across professions. Uh, additionally, I'm interested in the question of involuntary retirement as a concept, um, because there are, and there's been some papers talking about this too, and uh, involuntary retirement is sometimes measured differently in different studies um, where certain uh, reasons are attributed as being considered involuntary, such as having to retire for poor health. And I feel that some people in the study, you know, it may be if I didn't hand in my resignation letter, then they, for some people that would mean they didn't consider it involuntary. Um, or if they, yeah, essentially if they did, sorry, hand in the resignation letter. So for instance, if you had to uh, give up your job to take care of an elderly caregiver and you submitted your resignation, there may be some people who consider that an involuntary retirement and others who don't because they were still the ones who initiated it. Um, and lastly, which I just found out today and I'm very excited about it, I am going to have the opportunity to do comparative analysis using the Irish uh, longitudinal database on aging um, to be able to see how this uh, compares with with them. I'm sure small sample size is going to be an issue there as well, especially with allied health professionals, but I'm really looking forward to that and seeing how that di there, if there's a difference across countries. And that's it for now, so I look forward to hearing your questions. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Yuko, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I'd now like to open it up for questions. Just a reminder for um, the participants that muting will remain on, but you can enter your questions into the chat box in the bottom right corner of the WebEx um, window. So there is um, a first question, um, and you can also see that in the chat box. Um, the question is, what are your thoughts on the implications of RNs as caregivers in a both paid and unpaid setting? So on the job and then retiring to be caregivers for loved ones. Uh, the transi this transition is very interesting that one would retire from their professional caregiving job to an unpaid one. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, it's a big question. I think that it's because I didn't do qualitative interviews around uh, sort of the experiences of people who've retired and how they 
uh, they go from, you know, their job to maybe a job afterwards in terms of making, taking care of loved ones. I did certainly, I can't really speak to it broadly, but I definitely did look at the literature to see um, sort of what the patterns are. And certainly it's a very gendered thing. And we are uh, a very female dominated professions, allied health professionals and registered nurses. And in general, women are far more likely to give up work or to reduce their hours of work to take care of loved ones where men actually, um, at least in general, are more likely as the evidence indicates, to work more or work longer in order to pay for caregivers. So it's sort of an interesting, I think, partly tied up with the roles that women are expected to play, especially women in caring professions. Okay, great. Um, I guess I had another question that came to my mind is that um, the sample size that you used would cover all the different provinces in Canada. And with the healthcare system being provincially um, uh, determined. Did you see or were, was your sample size large enough to look at differences uh, between uh, people working in different provinces on their factors, for example, influencing early retirement? So the sample size unfortunately wasn't large enough to look at differences in factors, but um, in early sort of disc descriptive analysis, it was definitely clear that rates or rates and also the age of retirement was significantly different across provinces with, I believe, um, Newfoundland had the lowest age of retirement in many of the professions. And I think the province of Saskat uh, Saskatchewan, I feel like, might have had the highest age of retirement. So um, certainly there were differences cross-provincially in terms of age of retirement. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that also uh, with uh, provincial elections or, or um, governments turning over in different times and perhaps implementing uh, new changes to the system, it, it will make it very challenging to look uh, to look at it uh, with a small sample size. Um, the other question that uh, somebody had was to, um, you know, you look mostly at public uh, employees. Um, have you had a chance to kind of um, Think about how it would be different from private uh, employees or, you know, uh, health professionals that work in private settings, such as private, you know, long-term care homes, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And what differences you would expect to see? Yeah. So the evidence that I looked at, in any way, uh, indicates that people working privately do work longer, um, and that's typically more connected to sort of private practice. So pharmacists, in particular, one of the reasons I suspect that they were the highest in my in terms of average age of retirement and expected age of retirement is because I probably had some privately employed uh, pharmacists in there, and they do tend to work longer because they are often owners of a business and um, there's not always a, a pension. I think the biggest, one of the biggest things is definitely pension. So if you are self-employed, you don't necessarily have a pension. And so that decision might be different depending on how much money you've saved. The other reason I think it might be different in self-employment is it's a lot easier to make adjustments to your work hours and the type of work that you do when you're the one deciding on your own employment. So if you want to do this type of work or you don't. And I think that that's one of the flexibilities, one thing that makes working uh, later in life more tolerable, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that would be my suspicion. As far as people working in private sector, long-term care facilities, um, those sometimes would be unionized. So um, I'm not sure what the difference would be in those particular situations. I think to me it has more to do with sort of unionization versus non-unionization. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, you also mentioned that you um, are looking at the Irish, uh, or TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, and um, there's lots of other um, cohorts uh, available. Is there any um, reason why you chose to uh, look at TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging? Uh, because the Health and Retirement Study, I'm sure, has lots of information as well uh, in the U.S. about uh, retiring and, and health professionals. Yes. Yeah, the main reason is because there's a confederation of mm -hmm. Ireland and Canada University um, Foundation, I believe it's called, and they had um, awards basically that were available to do studies that looked at particularly um, connections and I guess and similarities between the Maritimes and Ireland. And so I applied for that just because I work at a university in the Maritimes. Okay. And so that was, it was more convenient. <laughs> but I am okay. certainly interested um, mm -hmm. in Ireland in particular and hope maybe eventually to be able to do more comparative analyses with bigger samples um, and in other countries. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Yuko. Um, for any of the participants that are uh, online, uh, please feel free to um, enter uh, questions in the chat box. Um, uh, and I will uh, continue to close the session, but if any um, questions pop up, I will interrupt that and, and take that question. Um, so, Dr. Yuko, thank you again for such an excellent presentation. It was really uh, uh, good to see uh, for myself as Cecilia say, Managing Director, how uh, how well uh, your presentation was put together and how you've used the data of the CLSA. So, we really appreciate that. And, and of course, we appreciate your participation in the CLSA webinar series. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for application is February 12, 2020. And please visit our CLSA website under data access to review available data and further information and details about how you can apply. Uh, specifically for a graduate student, there are fee waivers available. Um, I also like to remind everyone to complete their survey located under the polling option. If you don't see it beside the chat button on your screen, please click the drop down arrow and then will you find it. Okay, so um, our next seminar will take place on Wednesday, February 19th at noon. Dr. Alexandra Mayu, a scientist working with the CLSA at McMaster University, will present uh, some sarcopenia in the CLSA, the impact of diagnostic criteria on the agreement between definitions and the associ association of sar sarcopenia with falls, and registration for that is, uh, uh, is open right now. Um, finally, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows with an interest in longitudinal studies at aging are encouraged to save the date for SPA 2020. Now, this is not a real SPA, but it's, this is the summer program in aging that's funded by CIHR. Um, this innovative five-day training program will take place next June at the Hockley Valley Resort in southwestern Ontario, and applications will open in February on CHR's research net. So if you're interested in that, please uh, keep that uh, in mind. Uh, and remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we also invite you to follow us on Twitter, uh, and the handle is at CLSA underscore ELCV. So um, there are no further questions. So again, Dr. Yuko, thank you so very much for your presentation, and to all the participants, thank you uh, for attending today's CLSA uh, webinar presentation. Thank you.